My name is Ryan, I'm the student ministries pastor here, and I'm just so thankful that you're here this morning, that you're worshiping with us. Uh, it might have come a little bit early, but we made it, right? So uh, we are in a series, and we are talking about He Gets Us. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's this commercial that's been airing, and it's been all over the place. It was during the Super Bowl, uh, and it's been pretty successful. And the idea of the commercial is uh, they're just trying to start conversations about Jesus, and it's so successful at this that it's been viewed over 3.7 billion times, which is insane. Um, yeah. So a lot of conversations are being had, some positive, some negative, but it's okay because we're talking about Jesus. And so uh, we're going to continue with that in the, in the heart of that, and we're going to have conversations about uh, Jesus. And today, like, we believe that G Jesus was fully God. Uh, we also believe that he was fully human, and he was the greatest example of what it meant. He understands us. Uh, he understands us in our humanity, in our struggles. He gets us. And so today, we're going to be looking at a specific part of how he gets us, which is insecurity. Some of you might understand what that feels like. We all feel that way at certain points in time. Uh, but really, uh, insecurity is this uncertainty or this anxiety that we feel about ourselves. And so when I think about insecurity, I think about uh, social media. <laughs> and one of the things, uh, I've, I remember when I first discovered social media for the very first time. I was a sophomore in high school. And this girl came up to me and she said, do you have a MySpace? What's your MySpace? And I was like, I, I've got a flip phone. My, I just got it, it's sweet, got T9, can text like crazy. She's like, no, 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 like MySpace. And I just, what is that? And she's like, she shows me. It's this whole thing where you can make a page uh, and you can stylize it. You got your top eight friends on there, which was, kind of horrible, but you know, you knew where you stood. And so I'm starting to discover this thing. And for me, I, I started to get frustrated because you had to do all this coding to get your screen to look good. Uh, but honestly, I was a sophomore guy. And so if it meant talking to a girl, I was willing to learn anything, right? So I'm literally learning how to code, to put this page together, to put music on it, all this stuff. And I started getting obsessed with it because it was such a cool way to kind of control your image. Um, and if you know, MySpace kind of went away and it became Facebook. And Facebook, to me, was more corporate. I, I don't know if I, I liked it as much because everything was blue and white and you couldn't have a lot of control over what you were putting on there. And so you had to, I had to find a new way to kind of control my image. So it was through what I thought were going to be like great little like sentences and statements about my day. So, you know, the classic is like eating tacos, so good. And like, one person would like it, and it's like, man, they think I'm awesome, right? They love me and the tacos. No picture, by the way, just my description. They were good, all right? And then the next, finally, we get is Instagram, and that's kind of the world we now live in, where everything's visual. It's all these pictures. It's all of this way that we, we have uh, people think about us is through the pictures we post and, and the way that we kind of carefully craft this image of ourselves. When I think about that, uh, probably the most famous picture to me, at least, that just drives all of that feeling is the blue rooftops in Santorini. Now, this is an island in Greece. As you can see here, this beautiful place. Uh, and this person took their picture there. Totally unintentional, right? Like she did not mean to get that picture. She's not even looking at the camera. This is all candid. I'm just kidding. No, she planned all of this, right? Because she wants the world to think, look at my life. 
this is amazing. I, my life is always like that. And that's what we do. We put things out on social media because we want everybody to see how wonderful our lives are and how exotic the places we go are. And we celebrate those things, but at the end of the day, no one's posting their, their bad pictures, right? We get these ones. So this is the truth behind that picture. That's a line of people <laughs> waiting to take the same picture, the same exact one. Uh, in fact, that line is like over two to three hours long. Uh, so this is like the Disney World of Greece, I guess. But like this is not candid. <laughs> this is not fun. Uh, there's actually a whole industry behind this picture. Uh, what you can do is if you go here for a couple hundred euros, you can hire some locals. They'll give you clothing. They'll, make, they'll take you to the best spot and they'll take your picture for you. And to me, that's a great deal. I have an amazing exotic picture, 200 euros, of course. Right? I want everybody at home to think I'm amazing. And there was one travel blog, he was so distraught by this picture and this process. He was so upset about it. Uh, this is his comment. This is what he decided uh, what was happening here. He says, this experience, it was a cookie cutter, mass market charade, smashed and blended, ready to be spoon fed to an internet where the line between real and fake was smeared already. Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> All right, all right, guy, it's just a picture. He's, but he's upset, right? And what he's pointing at is, listen, we get these amazing pictures, we get this beautiful thing, but what's happening behind the scenes is ugly. Like, we all post the picture of us in front of the blue rooftops, but what's happening around us in life, it's messy and it's dirty. But we only want people to see the image that we give them because deep down inside, there might be a little bit of us that's feeling insecure. There might be that feeling of a lack of inner pride, like a, of instability, of inner peace. And so we cultivate all of these things and we post them loudly into the world so that they can see this. Well, the truth is, confidence is quiet and insecurity is loud. Like insecurity is a loud attempt to hide the discontent in that, that inner lack of inner peace and that shame where our boundaries are, where, where our limits are found, where we've fallen short. It's a loud attempt to hide all of that and just post it out into the world. The truth is, Jesus, he gets us. We might take our loud attempts to hide what's going on to him, but he can see right through it. Like Jesus can see straight into the core of who we are. He knows what we're trying to do when we try to mask that shame and insecurity. And he knows because only he could. So today, we're gonna look at a part in scripture where we might see some insecurity show up. And so just kind of set the scene for you. This is in Luke 15. If you have your Bible, you can open it. It's on the Bible app as well. Uh, Luke 15 is where we're going to be spending all of our time this morning. So the story here is Jesus is spending time with people that are kind of messy. They are not great. Let's just put it that way. They're not your, your, your top tier of society in the social circles. Uh, they're the people who are unloved and unlovable. And the religious leaders and the Pharisees, they, they see this and they get upset. Like, you are supposed to be a holy man, an example, and you're spending time with them? And so Jesus responds to their questions. So this is where we come on the scene in Luke 15. So the tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people. How could he do that? Even eating with them. So he's spending significant time. It's not like at an arm's distance. There's something about eating with people that, you know, the lines get, the boundaries get uh, blurry. And so they're saying like he's spending time with them. And this is a problem. How could you do that? So Jesus told them this story. And this is when Jesus begins to give parables or stories. And they're three of the most famous parables in the New Testament. Uh, the first one, there's a shepherd and he has a hundred sheep. One of the sheep gets out. He goes, he leaves the 99, he gets the one, 
and he brings it back and everyone celebrates, except for the Pharisees. Because a shepherd, well, that's, that's a lowly job. He's poor. He lost one sheep, who cares? He brought back one sheep, who cares? Next. So then Jesus tells another parable. So instead of 99 and one, it's gonna be one and 10, and it's this woman who lost a coin, and she's searching desperately through the muck of her house. Remember, this is like, this is back in the day, so the, the floor is disgusting, so she's looking through the cracks and crevices of her nasty floor for this one coin. She finally finds it, and she celebrates because she got her coin back. Pharisees don't really care, though. Why? Well, she's a woman and also she's poor. So not impressive to these religious leaders, but you see that like the scales are changing. At first it was 100 and we lost one, and now it's one of 10. And now we come to the climax of all of these and Jesus tells another story, and this time it's one of two. And this is where Jesus begins. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them the story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. You know how insulting that is? How insane that is? For the son to go to the father, what he's saying is, hey, I wish you were dead, but you're not dead, and so just give me your money now and we'll call it good. In fact, I could do more with you dead than with you alive, so just like, let's call it even. That is so disrespectful of the father. Any father that in their right mind would just cast him out and never talk to him again. But this one, so his father agreed to divide the wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and he moved to a distant land where there he wasted all his money in wild living. And so now we see the first thing, this first little bit of insecurity. You see, insecurity, it leads to discontentment. Our inward lack of peace, our inward lack of insecurity, this inward insecurity leads us not to be content. And we start looking outwards, and it leads to this discontentment that consumes us. My wife and I, we rented for eight years. We just, we were, we were always a little hesitant to buy a house. It just never seemed right. And eventually though, we finally, we bought a house um, and we, it was just like the most amazing thing. We got lucky, just being honest with you. We didn't ever expect to get the house that we got, but we got it and the market timing was good. And it was just like all of the conditions lined up and we love our home. It's beautiful. It's bigger than we thought we'd ever have. Uh, it's exactly what we want. It's nice. It's peaceful. We have all of these great things in our home and we are content with it or we were until we went to the open house down the street. We didn't know this was a mistake we were making. We just thought it was gonna be a fun Saturday, right? So we go down the street, there's these open houses. We've never seen the other houses in our neighborhood and there was five, they were just the model homes, but they were newly renovated and so we thought, how, this could be a fun way to spend our afternoon. So we walk there, the first house was amazing. Brand new everything, new appliances, the flooring was beautiful, the decorations were extravagant. It felt little but big at the same time. Like it was just everything that you would want in your home. And we just thought like, this is cool. Then we went to the next house and it was a little bit bigger than ours. And something happened to me. It was right about the time I saw the stainless steel appliances and there was an oven. I'm not positive, but I'm almost certain that you could start from your phone. And that was it for me. <laughs> I knew what I was lacking. And I was so, I was like, okay, that's cool. I don't have that. My stove, I had to like turn the knobs, right? And then my wife starts looking around and she's starting to see like curtains and things like that. And she starts spiraling. We don't have that in our home. So we go through the house, each house, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And we leave and we go back to our house and we go, we open the front door and there's just this kind of sigh. <laughs> like, ah, oh, we live here? <laughs> I thought this place was great. Like, when was the last time we swept? We, we noticed the paint chips on the wall, you know, like all these little tiny things. And I'm kind of going through like, man, this is dingy. <laughs> 
My wife, on the other hand, she is just spiraling. Like, we got to decorate everything. Like, take everything down. We're starting from scratch. We're going to Home Goods, and I'm like, babe, we can't afford that. You know, like, but she's ready. And so we had this moment uh, where all of a sudden we were so content with life that in the dream home that we had, all it took was to look down the street, and now we are so discontented with everything we have. And that's what's happening with this son, right? He has all that he needs, and yet it's not enough. There's this inner pride when he gets discontented. Look what I'm lacking. Look what I deserve. I can do better than you, Dad. The self-righteousness, and it leads to questionable decision-making. It leads to doing things that maybe he didn't think about doing before. We all do it. I jump on Instagram, see that friend on the amazing vacation. They're on a Greek island. How'd they do that? So you charge a vacation. Can't afford it, but I'm going and I'm getting that picture. We look down the street. We see your neighbor. He bought a second Tesla. Two? Oh, you have one. What world is he living in? That's awesome. And you start to question the things that you have in your home. You see, we work so diligently to create a perfect image of our life. And deep down inside, we're just hiding this need for resolution, this need for peace. And if we can keep up with the people around us, maybe no one will ever know. But here's what you need to know. Contentment, it's a biblical issue. It's a God issue. Because the moment you become in, that you lose your contentment, you actually have your joy robbed, stolen from you. The things that you appreciated before, you no longer appreciate. And so when it comes to understanding contentment, we need to understand what's God's heart in this. There's this uh, Greek philosopher, he, when he's talking about contentment, this is what he says. He says, do not spoil what you have, have by desiring what you have not. Remember that what you have, or what you now have was once among the things you only hoped for. So in other words, he's reminding people, and this is, this is an ancient Greek philosopher, so this has been something throughout time that we as human beings struggle with. He's saying, the things you have now, you once dreamed about. Don't forget that. Don't lose your contentment. The author of Hebrews, this is what he says. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Or never will I forget you. God has declared that he will never leave us. He'll never forget us. And so insecurity grows when we depart from that truth. That we depart from the love that is the foundation of our lives. This son has departed from the love of his father. And when that happens, when we depart from the love that is a foundation of our life, that God truly does care about us, that he truly wants what's best with us, and that he is always with us, don't be surprised if we make questionable decisions that lead to difficult circumstances. The younger brother had everything. And let's see where that insecurity takes him. So the story continues. About that time, his money ran out. All right, so he lost it all immediately. Uh, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. So not great luck for him, right? He probably put all his money in Bitcoin and then the economy crashed and here he is. And so now he's starving, and he persuades this local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. So this is not a high paying job. <laughs> this is not the one that you dream about. This is the one that you get because you've got to survive. And so he's working for this pig farmer, which by the way, he's Jewish. And so uh, there's this whole like cleanliness thing. You can't be around pigs, and now he's around them. But it gets worse. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. All right, so he's, he's looking at pig slop. This is where his life has taken him. And he's looking, he's like, hmm, 
I could eat that. Yum. <laughs> Nobody thinks that way about pig slop, right? Like you, in this, in my mind, it's at this point in time that he kind of comes to his senses, right? He, he's about to eat this, and then it says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. So even the, the most lowly person in, in my father's house had plenty of food. Like, what am I doing here? I'm about to eat this pig food. And so he returned home to his father. Insecurity creates difficult circumstances. Like, don't be surprised when you're living a life from insecurity, of lack of inner peace, of shame. You don't know who you are or what you are. Don't be surprised when you find yourself looking at pig slop and thinking, hmm, I could eat that. Right? Like he's broke, working for pennies. Like he's not making a lot of money and, the, and he's living in the consequences of his inner self. He's living because, with the consequences of his insecurity and his pride. He had everything he ever needed. None of us choose to eat pig slop. We don't just wake up one day and think, yeah, why not? If you do, I, you know, we should talk. But that's just not a normal thing, right? And so what happens? Well, it's just a step-by-step -step process that you eventually get to that point where this is where you are. We call it rock bottom. Where all of your, your life's insecurity, all of your shame, everything is out. The world can see now that you are at the very bottom. And that's typically where we go when we decide to depart from God's love. It's a downward spiral. You guys have all heard this. We know this, right? When you just continue to make decisions and you just keep going deeper and deeper down and eventually you're, you're at the bottom and you're looking at pig slop. Insecurity leads to buying a truck without telling your wife because you know she'll be upset, which leads to financial fights, which leads to separation, which leads to two Christmases which leads to kids struggling in school, which leads to struggle, and eventually the question, how did we get here? Nobody starts off with that end in mind. Nobody thinks that's the direction I want my life to head. See, that's the story. He just continued to spiral until one day, you're at the bottom. And most of us, we know what that's like and we know how, to, how that feels. And it's when we're at that moment that we think, God, I'm re I know now. When I have nothing left, I need you. I don't even have to go down this road, but I need you. And like the prodigal, we ask for God. When there's nowhere left to hide and we're at the very bottom. And before I just talk about that a little more, here's something I need to, you to know. Pain is not the only way God teaches us. Like pain is not the only way that God informs us how to love him. We believe in something called revelation, which that means like he's his revealed truth, which is the word of God, the, the scripture that we read. God gives us a way to never go down that path by just trusting in him. And so you might not be at rock bottom, but if you're making the steps, you can just stop and turn around and trust in God. You don't have to get to that point. In fact, I don't, even, I don't think God wants us to get to that point, but it, it takes some of us in our pride and insecurity to get all the way to the bottom to realize we needed him all along. But if you're taking those steps, you can turn around and trust in him. So let's see when the son is at rock bottom and he's crying out, it's over, it's done, and he's gonna go back home. He has this moment where he decides he's gonna give a speech, like we all would. We would tell our dad, okay, listen, I am so sorry. I get it now. I was wrong, you love me, you gave me everything. Just if I can be a servant, like I don't need to be a part of the house. If I could just be a servant, it'll be okay. And I could see him working the speech up and just imagining what his dad is going to do. And he finally gets to his home. And when he gets there, his dad takes off running towards him just running. And as he begins to give his speech, this is what the father does. 
But the father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. He interrupts him. He doesn't let him get the speech out. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So let the party begin. This is God's heart. This is God's heart for us when we come back home, when we were lost and at the bottom. When we feel like we are unlovable, God loves us. When we feel like we departed from him and there's no way that he could ever love us again. When we find ourselves, when we feel worthless, God says, no, you are worth everything. He gives him a robe. He says, this is my value. He gives him a ring. He clothes him. He takes care of him. Welcome home, son. When you are at your lowest low and you feel unloved, God is waiting for you to just come home. And that's the invitation of the prodigal. If your life and your insecurity and your pride has led you to a point where you're living in difficult circumstances, the invitation of the Father is come home. Come home. But this isn't the end of the story, right? It's one of two. The story continues, Jesus still talking to the Pharisees. This is what he says. The older brother, he hears all this stuff, by the way. He sees the parties going on. So the older brother comes home, and the older brother was angry and wouldn't go inside. So he's not going to go into the house. He's so upset. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours, notice that, not his brother, this son of yours, there's a line that was just drawn between him, the father, and this other brother, comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. It's like, we've saved up, we've been working this, and you just threw this huge block party for this son of yours. Here we find the heart of the story. You see, insecurity hides behind good intentions. Insecurity can hide itself by religious actions. He's actually saying the same exact thing, if you think about it, that the prodigal said, which is, I know better than you, dad. And he's actually, by doing so, found himself outside of the house. See, the older brother, he's parading around his own virtue. And we do that. We justify our insecurities behind religious actions. If we can just make God love us more, if I just do the right things, and I'm better than the people around me. I see this in so many ways. I've seen this in pastors who are still trying to get God to love them if they just preach well. I've seen this in church members and friends who hide behind giving or hide behind reading scripture. Uh, The other day I did this and so I'm okay now. My, My wife and I, we go on walks every night and it's just our way to unwind and really just talk about the day and and just spend time intentionally together. And we were starting this walk and my phone goes off. So I pull out my phone and there's a notification from the Bible app. I'm like, oh, and it says, your seven day streak is going great. Keep it up, do it again, because then you'll be on eight days. And I was like, I wanna be on an eight day streak. That sounds great. (laughs) Like, look at me. And so I boop hit the button and my wife looks over and she's like, are you reading scripture? I thought for a second that I could look very holy if I just said yes, <laughs> right? Like, why yes, babe? I do this every night as we start our walks. Like, ain't I something? But I know my wife and she knows me and so she would have read right through that. So I just was like, no, <laughs> like I'm not reading scripture. Uh, I was trying to keep my Bible streak up and she was like, are you serious? But it's funny funny because we do that, right? Like we we keep streaks alive because we want, again, a curated image that we can hide behind. But the whole intent is that you read scripture, that you spend time with God. 
My intent was an eight day streak so all my friends know, man, he's really reading his Bible app. We do that, I'm on a three week streak, I've been attending church three out of four weeks, we're going well. I was in small group, I'm doing well, God will love me. I pray before mostly every meal, uh, but you know, like my neighbor doesn't, so I'm doing okay. You know, it's entirely possible to hide our spiritual bankruptcy behind a perfect Christian image. And this is where Jesus is getting to. He's looking and he's saying, guys, the point is, the people that you don't like, I'm pursuing. That means your neighbor who somehow always gets their trash in your yard, God loves and is pursuing. That means the coworker that drives you crazy, God loves and is pursuing. That family member that has hurt you, God loves and is pursuing. And we have to check our hearts because the goal is that one day they're in this room with us and if deep down inside, we would be upset about that, then we have some work to do. And so the story ends with Jesus. He says, his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this day, this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And the parable ends. At this moment, Jesus finds himself surrounded by sinners, the lowly, the least of these, who are just anxious to hear a word of hope from him, to be in the presence of life. And on the outsides are the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the calloused hearts. In this moment, we never hear what the older brother said. He didn't, we don't know his response, but you can almost hear it. Like Jesus is turning this story into an opportunity for these religious leaders. And it is the same as the one for the prodigal son. Come home. I can see through this. Come home. And that is what God's heart message to you and I is. Come home. If you are far from God and a prodigal, come home. If you have been playing this spiritual game to hide what's really going on, come home. Jesus gets us in our insecurity. He can see straight through us and he understands. And you know what? Where we hide all of that, our inward shame and all of those things that make us deeply insecure, Jesus, he took that on the cross with him. And we should feel that, right? If we've been committing sins, we should feel that way and that guilt and all these things. But Jesus, he takes it. He took it on the cross. He lived a perfect life with none of that. He takes it into the cross. And when he dies and is resurrected from the grave, that means that all that died with him. And the next step that Jesus takes is he takes his throne and he takes it confidently. And so where you feel insecure, you can be confident in him, confident in his lordship, that he alone sits on the throne. Come home. If that is you today, if you want to follow Jesus and be confident in his love, you can do that here today. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I want to be in your presence. God, I want all of that deep insecurity, all that shame from sin. God, I want to, you to take it from me. Forgive me for it. I make you the leader and the savior of my life. and I choose to follow you forevermore. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.